Hi, everybody. Uh, let's hope that this video works a little bit better for you today. It is Tuesday, March 24th. And in this video, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Bill of Rights. And on the screen, you should be able to see that this is the tab that is um, labeled Introduction and Manipulation of the Bill of Rights. So <clears throat> when you watch this video and you review the documents in this tab, the homework is read, watch, and think. You don't have to do anything else other than that, other than listen to this video and think about the primary document that I'm posting uh, right there from James Madison to Thomas Jefferson from December 8th, 1788. And you don't even need to read the entire thing. I'm going to focus on some different elements as well as some context. Okay. Uh, also, the big thing that you need to focus on is my uh, quick guide to the Bill of Rights specifically. And then above and beyond that, if you scroll down, you see I've embedded some video parodies of the Bill of Rights. Um, one that is has Mr. Madison's face on it. That's actually from four years ago. So for some from students that are getting ready to graduate, um, this is a parody that they did for bonus for me, Lexi Ward and Aubrey Gebert. It's pretty good. Uh, they did it to the song Apple Bottom Jeans. So if you like TikToks, you're probably going to like that video. There's a video that I borrowed online that's to Miley Cyrus's Wrecking Ball. It's a parody. It's pretty good. There's a Vanilla Ice version of Rights, Rights, Baby. And then there's a Smart Song rap that is um, an original creation from the, uh, the Smart Song folks. And then Mr. Betts has one of his parodies there that is going to be, I'm going to be, it's the 500 Miles song. So you'll like that. These parodies are just different visuals and song references to help you understand the Bill of Rights. Um, to be honest with you, some of the Bill of Rights seem pretty easy and some of them are pretty loaded and complicated. So I'm going to help you be introduced to that specifically. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to click on the Bill of Rights a Quick Guide. And uh, on this document specifically, uh, you're going to see that... Um, True Gray's logged down looking at it too. Good for you, Hydro. Um, you're going to see that I've got the actual text of the first 10 amendments. They're in Roman numeral fashion. And then what I've done is I have bolded the parts that are most important for us to know about and also the parts that you might be most familiar with. And then next to it, I've created some like mnemonic devices that I use to remember it, like SPARP for the First Amendment, because inside the First Amendment, you have the freedom of speech press, assembly, religion, and petition, or you need two guns for a gun show for the Second Amendment. Three's Company, your parents might get that reference from the old TV show, Three's Company, because it deals with quartering soldiers inside of a house against your will. And then a little bit of bingo fun, before you search, you need a warrant. Um, take the Fifth is easy because most people understand that pleading the Fifth Amendment means not saying anything incriminating. Um, you can develop your own mnemonics for these, and um, what I'm going to do is hopefully explain what some of these different elements are uh, inside these amendments. But before we go any further, I kind of want to give you a little bit of context to the amendments, and I want you to look at the letter from James Madison to Thomas Jefferson. Keep in mind that this is after the government is, is beginning to be up and running. They've replaced the Articles of Confederation. They reached that magic number of 9 out of 13 on June 21st, 1788. And at this point, um, it looks like they're going to have all 13 eventually. Uh, they're still working on um, Rhode Island at this point. And um, they had just got, looks like, if I remember correctly, um, they almost have North Carolina. And they, they have Rhode Island coming in 1790. But they're going to be creating the new government. Just to give a little bit of context, this is a letter that Madison uh, wrote to Thomas Jefferson. So from Philadelphia, Madison's writing uh, this letter to um, Thomas Jefferson. And in here, he says some things like, you know, I think that uh, we're probably going to look to have George Washington become our first president of the United States. However, um, some people that are opposed to our government might try to, to um run a different candidate. And uh, he actually refers to these people that are not Federalists. He doesn't call them anti-Federalists. He calls them the enemies of the government. And at the head, and in the most inverterate of whom is Mr. Henry, he's talking about Patrick Henry, 
are laying a train for the election of Governor Clinton. So he's concerned that anti-federalists led by Patrick Henry might, um, once the government is up and running, decide that they're going to try to to get as many people of their mentality, their ideology and philosophy, anti-federalists, um, either elected or appointed to government positions to somehow sabotage his wonderful Federalist Constitution. Um, that's not going to happen. And George Washington is going to win in the Electoral College unanimously in a landslide. But it gives you a context that not everything was guaranteed at this point. Now, I kind of want to talk to you about some real, real world situations for um, James Madison, who is going to be elected to be a member of the House of Representatives from Virginia, and he's going to be part of the first Congress. And when he goes there, he's got a lot of things on his mind about how he's going to help out with the creation of the different executive agencies, how he's going to use some of these new government functions in Congress to solve problems for the nation. But he knows that he's going to have to address the big concern of the anti-federalists, which is, will there be a point where a Bill of Rights can be added to the U.S. Constitution? Now, at the Virginia ratifying convention, uh, Mr. Madison attended and he spoke, and he said that he would not oppose any amendments that might provide additional securities for liberty. He wasn't really excited or interested in the, uh, the idea of changing um, the U.S. Constitution fundamentally, but he said that he was positively committed to such amendments if they were presented in the House of Representatives, okay? He's going to think, oh, I'm the most familiar with the U.S. Constitution. It probably would be a good idea if perhaps I am responsible for helping write the National Bill of Rights, okay? Um, he's very concerned of a couple things. The first thing he's concerned about is if the first U.S. Congress does not take the suggestion of a creation of a Bill of Rights seriously by the Anti-Federalist, then the Anti-Federalist might do something quite drastic. And this was a definite concern for Mr. Madison. The first one was the Anti-Federalist might call for a new constitutional convention. I mean, think about it. If the Articles of Confederation were replaced kind of in a wishy-washy way at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, what's going to stop the Anti-Federalist from getting out the word to citizens, hey, if you don't like this new government, let's just get rid of it and create a new one. Let's have another convention in 1790 in uh, Savannah, Georgia, or in Williamsburg, Virginia, or in New York City, New York. And that is really scary because Madison's concerned that that would disrupt the stability of the new government, which is just now beginning to, to go. And two, it's, it sets the tone that whenever people aren't happy with their government, they can just throw it on the trash pile and start over. And that's not a precedent that Mr. Madison wants. So he says, look, if I take up this charge of making sure that we can honestly consider a Bill of Rights, then maybe that will avoid us having a constitutional convention or many constitutional conventions and never having a chance at a stable U.S. government. So that's a practical concern um, that it's embedded in fear Mr. Madison wants to take care of. Okay. The other thing is, is that He's really concerned that if a lot of anti-federalists are elected to Congress, then they might use that opportunity to neuter or disarm in the U.S. Constitution. Like they might not use all the powers that the Constitution has, or they might slowly get rid of some of the powers that the federal government has. So long term, uh, he needs to show people that by participating in the new U.S. Constitution government, that things are going to be okay. And he starts to develop this idea where, whereas if someone disagrees with you because of the Bill of Rights, not it being in the U.S. Constitution, then if that's their biggest concern with the government, if giving them the Bill of Rights uh, makes them feel better, they're going to maybe go from being an anti-federalist to a federalist. They're going to go to go from critiquing and criticizing the new Constitution into maybe supporting it. So you could make friends of your philosophical enemies. Uh, that is the right thing to do for Mr. Madison, and it's good politics for him, okay? Now, another thing that he really needs to think about is this. Um, he narrowly is elected to uh, the first Congress, and he gets the feeling that if he doesn't, as an individual representative for his congressional district in Virginia, um, get them this Bill of Rights, he might lose his seat. and That would be really embarrassing for a guy that's it's already being proclaimed as maybe this father of the Constitution, this guy that helped write this plan. 
He's the author, a lot of people know at this point, of many of the Federalist Papers. If he gets defeated in an election in the House of Representatives to go to the House of Representatives and serve Virginia, that's embarrassing for him. So in order to keep his commitment to the voters that he's representing and his electorate, he's going to have to commit to them. Hey, I'm going to get you this Bill of Rights so you feel better about not only being a Virginia citizen, but American citizen too. Okay? So in order to identify people that he needs to forge relationships with and to ensure the potential for a long-term success in the federal government, he's going to he's going to to uh, to write the Bill of Rights. Um, he wants to be the primary author so that he can kind of control their effects. He wants to make people happy, but he also doesn't want the Bill of Rights to be attached to the Constitution and somehow destroy what he believes it stands for or to water down its power and effect, okay? Um, you can find a lot of that context um, in the last part of this speech, uh, this letter from James Madison to Thomas Jefferson, where he's talking about his concerns and he's talking about his plan uh, for what he's going to do uh, once once he uh, gets to Congress, okay? So uh, you, can, you can review this letter for context if you want, or you can listen to this video and know that's what's in this letter, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about these Bill of Rights, okay? So the plan is, is that these Bill of Rights are going to be um, written by Congress, and according to the text of Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution, um, both houses of Congress would have to concur with two-thirds of their members voting on each one of these amendment language. Now, there are 12 potential amendments that are proposed in the Bill of Rights. However, only 10 of them become amendments at the same time on December 15th, 1791. One never becomes an amendment, and one is not ratified by the several states as, as a minimum number, three-fourths of the states in, until 1992 when I was 11 years old, which is crazy to think. But that one is actually our most recent constitutional amendment. The 27th Amendment was written by Mr. Madison and approved by both houses of Congress um, and then sent out to the several states for their consideration and ratification at the same time. It didn't get the magic number, which changed in 1992. Three-fourths of 50 states is 38. And if you've got a calculator, you can do these real easy. And three fourths of 13 states is 9.75 and you always round up to make it harder so in order to get any of these proposals to be adopted by three-fourths of the state legislatures or three-fourths of state uh, ratifying conventions and these were done by the legislatures you needed 10 of the 13 states to ratify or adopt them Okay, so of the 12 that are um, proposed by Congress, the first U.S. Congress, uh, written largely in Mr. Madison's hand, influenced largely by his experiences in the Virginia ratifying convention and his familiarity with the Virginia state constitution and other state constitutions, which had their Bill of Rights embedded in them, um, namely the Virginia um, Declaration of Rights is at the beginning of their U.S. Constitution. It's it's kind of ironic that ours come after the text of the U.S. Constitution. He uses those as a way that he can make almost a generic or like a sample version, a very uh, broad language that he thinks is going to make people happy without destroying the powers of the U.S. Constitution. So the first thing you'll notice is if you do a Google search for um, the proposed Bill of Rights, the numbers are not going to match up at all uh, with the numbers in the modern day Bill of Rights. And that's because the order that they uh, become part of the U.S. Constitution is the order that they're ratified. OK, so the First Amendment today always seems like it comes first because it's always what we've known it as. It was not the first one labeling wise necessarily. It's the first one that's ratified, okay? So the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof 
or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. These are considered to be individual liberties. Today, we kind of look at them as extremely personal because they deal with our freedom of speech, our freedom of practicing religion, of having religious thoughts, uh, of having almost a freedom of conscience. It also builds in our rights for how we can protest, how we can demonstrate, how we can petition the government for change. Okay, And the, the Supreme Court and the federal courts and even the state Supreme Courts have all thought about where is the line, where is the extent for how these protections work. I'm going to give you guys some scenarios that you can look at throughout the week to manipulate these to see where you think things are appropriately decided, okay? The Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Such a simple statement that people are willing to literally fight each other over, it seems, um, because it's a rather loaded statement. If you look at the history of the Second Amendment, we know that people are very concerned about their government having a standing professional army. So the idea that they would be able to keep their own personal firearms and train in local militias because they're concerned that the government might come and march into their town to take their property or infringe on their liberties is an embedded protection against the government on the states, on the people of the states. Today, we know that the Second Amendment means a lot more than that because it's been interpreted that People can own and possess their own personal firearms. The conversation begins saying, well, is there an extent to the type of firearms that they can they can own and possess? Should there be any qualifications or standards to, for the protection of themselves and others? Is everybody able to own these weapons in an equal manner? Or should we draw the line and say people that have been to prison, people that have been convicted of violent crimes, uh, people that have maybe uh, seen psychiatric or mental health professionals, um, if they can't drive a car, should they be brandishing shotguns in their personal residence? Can they have any weapon in their personal residence? See, there's a lot of questions to ask, and that's why we have a judicial branch to help us see where we are in accordance to our rights. The third Amendment no one spends any time on because it seems ridiculous to us, but this is directly out of our experience in colonial times, colonial history, where the government, the British government, would be able to forcibly quarter troops in your residence. Now, it would be absurd for us to think right now that the government is going to kick you out of your home and evict you or force you to keep U.S. Marines or Coast Guard sailors in your house, but this is a protection to make sure the government can't do that. Okay. Today, even in the midst of a, um, a, an epidemic, a global public health emergency, the government cannot forcibly evict you from your homes to shelter troops that might be in the area. They're going to be looking, if they come to a town like ours and they need to use space to quarter, say, Ohio National Guardsmen, they're probably going to look to churches and they're going to look to schools primarily for space to set up mobile field hospitals, uh, barracks. Um, and on-the-fly service centers for, say, food and resource distribution. And they're not going to be doing that just by seizing things. You better believe that because of the history with the Bill of Rights, they're going to be asking local authorities and um, local citizens specifically first for permission, even in the midst of an emergency. The Fourth Amendment is something that most of us know because we've watched enough law and order or cop shows that in order to search your personal private property, um, there has to be a warrant. It says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, which means on their body, in their houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, there's a great term right there that most of you have heard watching cop shows and movies, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Think about how upset American colonists used to be when British officials could just seize and search their ships, their cargo, and their property without a warrant. It feels like you're being violated from the government. This is a protection from those unreasonable searches and seizures. It doesn't mean that if you're doing something wrong, you can get away with it. 
it means that the government should not be able to just go without a whim, on a whim, go through your property, go through your home, search you without reasonable expectations for probable cause. The Fifth Amendment's got a lot in here, so let's pay attention. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury. Okay, so which means if you're going to be charged with the crime, you have to be indicted by a grand jury. Jury of your peers needs to review evidence. A local prosecutor is going to say, is there enough information here for me to bring charges? If they feel like there is enough there that you are suspected of that crime, they're going to go from you being arrested and detained to issuing an indictment uh, for you to actually go to have a hearing and go to a trial. Okay. Now, then it says, nor any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life and limb. This is called double jeopardy, which means if you're put on trial for, say, uh, attempted murder <clears throat> of your neighbor and the jury comes back and says, we find you not guilty. And that's different than a hung jury that you're not guilty. Um, they can't just keep indicting you over and over and over again until a different jury finds you guilty. Okay. That's why criminal prosecutors are going to be so careful with making sure they have enough evidence to charge and indict someone formally, because if they go to trial and there's not enough evidence there, and the jury says, we find this person uh, not guilty, they're, they're innocent until proven guilty, and we couldn't prove them guilty without a, beyond a reasonable doubt. They're going to walk free, and they will not be charged with that same criminal um, uh, act ever again. They can't because of double jury jeopardy. Nor shall they be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against themselves, which means you cannot be forced to testify if, your testimony might incriminate you of some action. So if you were part of an alleged crime, you weren't the person that's put on trial, but by telling the prosecutors or defense attorneys what really happened there, you're going to somehow incriminate yourself. You can say, I'd like to take the fifth uh, because I, I believe I might incriminate myself. Now, what that does is it lets everyone know, hey, if we do our due diligence and look stuff up, that, that guy or gal might have done something too. But it can't force you to provide testimony um, that can somehow make you a witness against yourself. Nor can you be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Due process of law means your ability to participate in your criminal hearings. You have an opportunity to know what you're being charged of. You have an opportunity to be a part of the process. Um, and this comes from English constitutional um, tradition where before rights were won from the king and parliament, People could be locked up indefinitely in a dungeon. Without due process of law, a decision is going to be made without you actually being able to participate in it. And we know that even in school systems, you have due process, which means if you're under 18, your parents need to be notified and they can be present. And you need to you need to be able to be part of a conversation if it's about you and any alleged crimes or incidents that might be about you. You have an opportunity to participate in your outcome. Okay, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. This is the one that people are like, why is this in here? Okay, um, this is called eminent domain, not imminent, eminent, E M E I N E N T domain, eminent domain. Um, so if a local government needs to use your property, say for expanding a highway. Um, there's no other way that they can build this highway unless they go through your property. You have to be able to demonstrate that there's no other reasonable way that they can complete a project or fulfill a public need without affecting your personal and private property. So there's a couple things that they have to do. One, they have to reach out to you plenty of time in advance and say, look, we need to extend this runway for an airport or we need to build this road. Um, we need to go through your property or we need to put in a utility um, access point here for sewer or gas or water. We need to buy this property from you. And what they have to do is they have to make you an offer of just compensation. And that can include things like picking up and moving your house, helping you um, uh, take care of those expenses. Um, they can make you an offer for all of your property so that you can buy somewhere else and relocate. You also can deny that. But if it goes to court and the government can demonstrate that there really was no other way that they could do that project 
and you didn't want to take their offer, then they can seize your property. So if it comes to that and you don't have a great lawyer, take the compensation if it's worthwhile, particularly if they're willing to like pick up your house and move it, because that's cool for us to watch. Amendment six, uh, I have it listed as 60 second session before trial. That's alliteration. Amendment six stuff is your trial proceeding stuff. These are the fun ones that you know from law and order and, and CSI and all that fun stuff. So it says, um, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial. Not like you're they're going to fast track you immediately and it's over and done with before you're prepared. But it means they can't keep you in jail waiting for two or three years before you get to have a hearing. There is a process for you to set up and have and have a hearing and to begin the trial process. Because if you know you're innocent and you're in jail for five years waiting for a trial, you've already served five years. Even if you're guilty, you're never going to get that back. So you have the right for a speedy and public trial, not a secretive one. The impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law. Okay, so which means uh, you deserve to have a trial in proximity to where you live so that the jury of peers around you are people that might share the same background and ideas and values as you. They're not going to pick you up in convoy, make you have a trial in Cleveland, Ohio. It doesn't make sense. Um, you don't live in there. You don't live there. People don't know you. You might not even share some of the same values or ideas. Okay. Uh, it says, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation. So that's why when you get your Miranda rights written to you, which comes from Miranda versus Arizona Supreme Court case, you're informed of why you're being detained and what you're being accused of. You have the right to be confronted with witnesses against you. So you have the right to know who is saying this about you and to confront them, which means you can have your defense attorney ask them questions um, to counter their testimony, to see if they're lying about you or if they're presenting a false narrative. And you have a compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in your favor. You have the right to call witnesses that can provide testimony on your behalf and to have the assistance of counsel for your defense. You have the right to an attorney. We know now because of the Supreme Court cases that you have a right to an attorney. Even if you can't afford one, a public defender will be appointed for you. Amendment 7 is following up with more trial stuff, but this deals with civil cases. So keep this in mind. All of your Amendment 7 stuff is not criminal cases. It's all It deals with civil cases, which are things like disputes over property and lawsuits and monetary claims. It says, in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20. So that's everything now. The right of trial by jury shall be preserved and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States and according to the rules of common law. So if you're in a civil trial, those are typically done with a magistrate or a judge ruling over that. It feels a lot like a uh, court on TV where you see people complaining about like um, someone stole their rent or stole their property. You have the right to a trial by jury if it comes down to civil matters that exceed $20, which is which is everything. If you have any complaints less than $20, you shouldn't be going to trial anyway because you're going to pay way more than that for attorney fees. Article 8, I've got as handcuffs because that's just the number 8 and I turned it sideways to make it look, look like handcuffs because it says excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed nor cruel and unusual punishments be inflicted. Um, the punishment has to meet the crime and you can't be held on a million dollar bail for uh, a simple crime and judges have different recommendations and standards for for bail um, uh, statements uh, so that you can post bail which means you pay a money insurance policy and you promise not to run away and you promise to come back for the day of your hearing or your court dates um, and that bail um, can be lost and forfeited if you don't do that well okay uh, the Ninth Amendment says, power to the people, and these are reserved rights to the people. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So, if there is nothing in the Constitution that either talks to a specific concern that you have as an individual citizen, and it's neither saying that you do or don't have it, it doesn't speak to it at all, 
you can use the Ninth Amendment to assure that it is being reserved to you. If the Constitution doesn't speak to that situation and nothing is there and it's taking away your right to do something, you can assume that you have the right to do that until a federal or state law may quantify that. Okay, so this is like little kids saying, oh, you didn't tell me I couldn't do that. Well, if the Constitution says you can't do something, you can't do it. But if it doesn't speak to it at all, you can assume that you have the right to do it. Now, keep in mind with federalism that your state constitution might speak to something as well. And then underneath fundamental law, statutory law might look to it as well. So, for example, if you don't know if you have the right to do something or not, and it's not in the U.S. Constitution, and then you don't think it's in the Ohio state constitution, you would then look for Ohio Revised Code, which is our statutes or laws created by our Ohio General Assembly, okay? Uh, the Tenth Amendment is similar. It's reserved powers to the states. It says the power is not delegated to the United States government by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it, nor prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people, which means, just like the Ninth Amendment, that if the Constitution doesn't um, speak to any powers uh, for the U.S. government doing something, that means the states can do it. The big ones here are the state police powers. The state is responsible for things like um, the health and public safety of citizens. You're not going to see concerns like that, like public health issues in the U.S. Constitution. You're going to see it in the state constitutions. That's why we've seen state governors um, be responsible and set up policies during this emergency situation because they have it on the line in their state constitution. It's their responsibility to take care of the, the health and welfare of their citizens specifically. Okay, so there's a quick rundown of those amendments. To be honest with you, most students struggle with some of them until they get to do a manipulation exercise. So what I'm going to do on, tomorrow is I will post a manipulation exercise that's going to let you kind of think about these different Bill of Rights amendments and kind of play with them and see what scenarios might fit. Is this an appropriate application of, the, of this amendment? And just to think and manipulate it. Um, all right. And then one other thing I'll do is I'm going to post an extra credit act opportunity for you, where if you want to make your own parody video or song about the Bill of Rights, you'll have the opportunity to do so too. As always, please feel free to contact me with your, your questions through email or by phone call or text. And a reminder on Tuesday, March 24th at 4 p.m., I'm going to do a Facebook Live video. Um, and you can either ask me questions about the Bill of Rights or you can follow up with me about the U.S. Constitution. The bulk of that conversation is going to be about Articles 1 through 7. And I'm going to speak to questions that will be involved in your scavenger hunt. I hope you're having a great day. Uh, it's day six of our remote learning. It's We're two days into the fourth nine weeks. And it feels really weird. But we're going to do well. Sun's going to start coming out more. I know that sounds weird considering it snowed yesterday, but it's going to get warm and we're going to be able to do this together. Please take care of the people that you care about most and yourself. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye, guys.